Hello learners, I hope the revision program for geography is still going well. Uh, what we'll do today is we will look at uh, exam type questions uh, for map work. Now let's just focus on the different sections. Remember the last time I told you it's 20 marks for uh, exam type questions regarding uh, multiple choice. Uh, let's start off looking at the multiple choice questions. Now, in this section, I am not uh, going to give you all the different multiple choice questions because it's going to come up again in the calculations. But what we do is we focus generally on the sections that are being tested under the multiple choice. Remember, you can get tested on any section in map work when it comes to the multiple choice. So let's just uh, focus and look at uh, the sections itself regarding the multiple choice section. All right, so in this section here, generally, you could be tested on things like uh, scale, map projections, map index, coordinates, direction, identifying features on a topographic or auto map, or a photo map, contours, intervisibility. These are the sort of common sections that can come out. But please note, you can get tested on the other sections also. Uh, let's look at a few examples of some of the multiple choice questions. Uh, for instance, uh, the scale uh, as given down here, the scale of the autophoto map is five times smaller than the scale of the topographic map is equal to the scale of the topographic map, uh, 10 times smaller than the scale of the topographic map, or five times larger than the scale of the topographic map. Uh, scale sometimes gives a problem. Learners look at the number. They think 1 is to 50,000 is bigger than 1 is to 10,000, but visualize cutting an orange. If I'm cutting it into the same size orange, I'm cutting into 20 pieces, and the same size orange, I'm cutting into five pieces. When I'm cutting into 20 pieces, I'm getting smaller pieces. And five pieces, obviously, I'm getting bigger pieces. So the scale of the autophoto is larger than the scale of the topographic map. And when we look at it, the scale of the autophoto, as indicated on your maps, is uh, the topographic map is 1 is to 50,000, and the autophoto is 1 is to 10,000. So if you work that out, 10,000 goes into 50,000, it goes in five times. Therefore, your answer would be D. It's five times larger than the topographic map. Let's look at another multiple choice question. Uh, the autophoto is obtained from and of course, this is just simple uh, knowledge. The vertical aerial photograph. Let's look at another one. The topographic map is drawn on a calculated grid latitude of latitude pro, uh, or longitudinal uh, latitudinal and longitudinal lines. This projection is referred to as the. This is South African maps the gauze conform projection. Now, some of these questions you may say, where am I getting them from? And remember, uh, when, I, when I did an overview earlier on, I did mention that we need to look at the map and analyze it. And this is actually can be a very simple question because when we look at the map down here, it states gauze conform projection that's used on South African and maps itself. Uh, just one more multiple choice question itself. Uh, spot heights, benchmarks, trigonomical stations, contour lines represent something on the topographic map. Okay? And here it is altitude above sea level. Now, these are just a few multiple choice questions. Obviously, I mentioned coordinates and I mentioned uh, uh, map code, etc. I will, as I'm going through 
the calculations and those steps, uh, we will go through how to answer that. Please remember when it comes to the multiple choice, there will be a block on the side. Uh, in that block, you will write the appropriate letter or the correct answer. Okay, you're answering on the question paper itself. Uh, let's look at uh, the calculation or working out of uh, certain parts of the map work. Obviously, this could most probably come out in the multiple choice, but I told you I'll go into a little more detail so you know how we get the answers. Uh, the first one we're going to look at is map index. I know some of you call it map code. Now, what we need to know is that at the top, of the topo map, you've got this indicated. Now, it's 2527 CA when we're using the map of Rustenburg. Uh, 25 refers to the latitude, 27 the longitude, and then there's C and A there next to it. Uh, on the autophoto itself, You've got 2527 CA also written. This is the photo number, uh, the number for photograph. Remember, a topo map is divided into photographs. And the 20th photograph is this one that we have for this map. Now, let's look at it. We're taking that 25 latitude and 27 longitude and we're going to draw a block. You must remember again, it was 25, uh, 27, and as indicated on the map, C and A. Now, our latitude is 25, and our longitude, please learners, you tend to confuse this. Sometimes we take Longitudes going this way, remember uh, your latitude lines run that way and your longitude lines run that way. And that longer lines of longitude increase in an easterly direction and lines of latitude increase in a southerly direction. So I've got 25, 27. I'm going to create a little grid. This refers to the big block C. So I'm first going to divide my blocks or my block into four. This would be big block A, big block B, big block C, and big block D. This refers to the small block. So once I've done, I further divide my big blocks into four smaller blocks. So this would be small block A, small block B, small block C, small block D. I do it for all my blocks. I divided this into four. So when I look at this, it's 25, 27. I've got my lines of longitude and latitude correct. Latitude 25, longitude 27. And then it's big block C and small block A. I've got that already positioned. I know exactly where Rustenburg is is. Now I'm ready to work out anything that they give me, any other town around Rustenburg itself. So let's look at a question. It says, determine the map index of the town that can be found to the southeast of Rustenburg West. Okay, southeast. I'm going to go back to my last slide. Let's look at where's south east itself. And if I look at this point, this is south east. I first need to look at has the line of longitude, latitude, or longitude changed? No, it's in the same block. Okay? So immediately my answer will stay the same. It would be, if let's remove this. All right, it still would be 25, 25. Okay. So the latitude hasn't changed, and the longitude hasn't changed. It's 27. 
Has the big block changed? No, it's in the same block. So it's C. The small block, has it changed? Yes, it moved to D now, because that's the town southeast of that. And basically, that's my answer. OK? And if I look at my slide down here, it's 27, 25, 27, C, D. Let's get a little more difficult down here. All right? Uh, I want to find the town, the map index of the town that can be found to the northwest of Rustenburg. OK? Let me go back to my slide down here. I'm looking at northwest. OK? So I'm looking here. That is your northwest direction. We need to look number one. Has the line of latitude or longitude changed? Is it the same lines of latitude? Yes. Has the line of longitude changed? Yes, because now we moved in this direction. So remember when it goes this way, it decreases. We've now moved into the 26 degree block. And if it goes that way, it would increase. So it decreases this side. So it is 25. And obviously now it changed. It's 26. 26. Uh, then we need to look at the big block and the small block. So we, it's very nice. We could actually draw another block. I would like to erase this. We could draw another block around here. OK? And we could do our block again, and our block again, and we make our big block, and our small block. We know this is big block B. OK? So it's 25, 26, big block. Because this is big block A, that becomes big block B. Small block A, small block B, small block C, small block D. So answers change now. It's become 25, 26, B, D. OK, moving on to the next uh, section that could be tested even on multiple choice is map coordinates. Now, I know people have huge problems with this, where they work with the seconds, etc. We're going to basically work with minutes. And it's going to be quite simple if you just follow my methods. Now. When I look at this, it says, determine the coordinate grid reference of, uh, of uh, spot height 1146 in block C8. Now, first of all, I must look at what do I have, the information I have. Now, if I go to block C8, on my topo map here, block C8. I would find my feature somewhere around here. So let's look at what is known. It's 33, uh, 34, and 35 minutes. So already I have an answer that I can put down. Uh, for this one, and I know my line of latitude is 25 degrees, 35 point something minutes south. That's what I have there, okay? I'm not sure about the minutes. When I look at my line of longitude for C8, I notice it's 27, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So for line of longitude, I've got it 27 degrees, uh, 12 point something minutes east. Remember how we got our east? That's increasing in the east. How we got our south? That's increasing in the south. We don't actually know the point of a minute. Now, very quickly, what I do is 
I'm actually going to show an enlarged version of that block C8. I need to know that my feature is not exactly on those line of latitudes that indicated. So, for my line of latitude, I need to measure from the 35 minute line to the feature. And if you measure at home, you would find it's around 12 millimeters. All right? I also know that the size of my blocks are always 37 millimeters. I always write my millimeters as a scribble. Okay, but it's 37 millimeters. Okay, so that is 12. All I need to do then is, if I work this out, and I put 12 millimeters over 37, because that's the size of the block, I want to find that ratio there. And if I get the answer, I would find that it's about 0 0.3. OK? 12 divided by 37 is about 0 0.3. OK? Now, all I need to do is, so I measured this, and I've got 12 over 37. Now, very quickly, this uh, uh, 12 over 37, uh, 12, uh, 30, 12 divided by 37 gives me an answer of 0 0.3. So what do I need to do is, if I rewrite my stuff, it's 25 degrees, 35 point something. I just take that 3. It becomes 35.3 minutes south. OK? I take the next one, my 27 degrees, 12 minutes. I need to find out the uh, uh, comma of a minute. So I just quickly write it down, 27 degrees, uh, 12 point something minutes east. So uh, I need to find that out. So what do I do quickly? I measure between, or I measure the size of the block. Generally, the size of this block is around 33 millimeters, but it can change to 34, or it can be 32. You must remember the globe itself, right? It's geoid in shape, so it narrows towards the poles. So your lines of longitude can get further apart or closer together. Generally, it's about 33. On this map, the distance from there to there is 33 millimeters. So all I do is I measure the distance from the 12-minute line to the feature, and I got an answer of 40 millimeters, which you should get also. And very quickly, I then say 14 divided by 33, and when I work that out, I should get around 0 0.4. This four, I take and I put it in there, and that's my answer. So I don't need to work a lot of calculations, etc. All I need to do is that, and I've got my answer. Uh, regarding coordinates. Uh, well, let's look at some of the calculations now. Obviously, some of these calculations, like a distance, can come on multiple choice again. But let's look at how we work out the calculation sections. And the first thing we're going to look at is calculating distance. Now, obviously, there's a formula. And remember, if it comes out of calculation, you have to show the steps. I strongly advise that you also show the formula. You don't have to do it as long. You can just do it in the shortened version. It's map distance times scale. A point to note here, please check which resource you are using. The autophoto is 1 is to 10,000, and the topographic map is 1 is to 50,000. Students tend to make a mistake here. They use the wrong uh, scale itself. OK, let's then. Look at one of them here. It says, calculate the straight line distance between trick beacon 37 in D3 and spot height 1232 in D5. Obviously, this information is always given to you, so it's easier to identify it on the map itself.
But I'm not going to look at the map here. I've enlarged uh, pieces of the map, and we look at it down here. OK? So my first step at straight line distance is to take, I always say I like my big ruler, but in this case, we'll use one of the smaller ones, is to take the two areas down here, or the two points given, and to measure the distance on, the, on this. Obviously, this is exaggerated, so it won't be the correct measurement here, but on your maps, you will be able to do it. And when you measure on your maps, you've got the map distance of 8.8 centimeters. All right? It'll also depend on, remember, please note, the ex examiner could ask you to do it in kilometers or meters. Obviously, you will change it. If it's kilometers, your answers will be in kilometers. If it's meters, your answers in meters. Uh, down here, I am showing you the full method. I'm working out in all the different uh, units. So I'm looking at it, working it out in centimeters down here. It's 8.8 .8 centimeters. That's your distance on the map multiplied by the scale. We're using the topo map, remember. And once we multiply this, we're then getting an answer of 440,000 centimeters. That's your actual distance. Obviously, if you want it in kilometers, then you will convert that. And that's very, very simple because there's 100,000 centimeters in a kilometer. So 100,000, I'll have to move five zeros. Remember, 100,000, which is five zeros. One, two, three, four, five. And all I do is one, two, three, four, five. And I've got an answer of 4.4 kilometers. OK? If you look at uh, meters, remember there's a 100 centimeters in a meter. So I'm going to move two places. So if I had to move for that, it will be 1, 2, 4,400 meters. Uh, the same formula will apply for winding distances also. Remember the string. This is what we use. I know some people use uh, the compass or the divider. Some people use pieces of paper. But I'm going to use the string method. OK? So it says calculate the curve winding distance from G in F2 to H in E4. OK? So very quickly, I'll give you an Stack from the map again. Remember, this is exaggerated again. I take my string, and I start from the point. OK, remember, my string mustn't be stretched. I hold it firmly, and I go through. I can leave the first end because I know exactly where it is. And I go through, and I measure the distance itself. OK? And I measure right through the end. And if you had to measure on your map using the string, you should have got your seven or around your seven centimeters. Now, how would I know is that? I just take it, I place it on my ruler. Now, remember on your ruler also, guys, use the one showing you the millimeters and not the one only showing you centimeters because you may not just get an exact answer of seven centimeters. Sometimes you could get 7.5 and you'll be able to read uh, your millimeters. The formula then is basically the same. The only difference is that you use the piece of string. OK? It'll be basically the same. I took my 7 centimeters multiplied by 50,000. And then I've got 350,000 centimeters. As you can see, when it's converted to kilometers, it's divided by 100,000. And therefore, you get uh, 3.5 kilometers. Now, I've just got another point here where we're saying converted to meters. Now, here's the learner. I'm just going to show you a slide here. Converted it correctly, 3,500 meters, but writes the wrong unit. Uh, writes the wrong unit down here. Now, visualize this. You've worked out everything correctly, but you wrote the wrong unit. 
and the answer becomes incorrect. So we need to be careful. The answer here should have been meters. So just putting the wrong unit makes your answer wrong. So just be careful for that. Let's look at the next calculation. That's the calculation for area. Now, I know in most scientific cases, it just says length times breadth. But I just worry. When pupils multiply length times breadth, they forget about the scale. So I always say you write it down with, uh, you always write it down as length times scale times breadth times scale. Uh, that is your important thing down there, so that you don't forget when you're answering the questions. Okay, let's then look at the abstract from the map, which I have in front of me here. And I measure the uh, length and the breadth of this. Now, when I look at the block itself, the quest, or rather the question, let's just look at the question quickly. Determine the area of block K7 in kilometers squared. So when I take block K7, I measure the length, I've got 37 millimeters. When I measure the breadth, I've got 33 millimeters. I could convert this to uh, 3.7 centimeters. And this one as 3.3 centimeters. I just hope you guys don't write like me at the end of the year. Eh? Make it easier for us to mark. Uh, so I got that. I measured my length and my breadth. I first put down my uh, formula. And then it's 3.7 centimeters. And remember, I'm using the topo map. If I use the autophoto, it should have been 10,000. But I'm using the topo map here, which is 50,000 centimeters. And then, of course, I multiply it by my breadth, which is 3.3 centimeters on the map, and, of course, the scale of 50,000 centimeters. When I multiply this, I've got an answer of uh, 185,000 centimeters, and I've got 165,000 centimeters. Obviously, to convert it again, we know that 100,000 centimeters in a kilometer, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it gives me 1.85 uh, kilometers. And then here, I'm again five zeros, which gives me an answer of 1.65 kilometers. I then multiply it. And I've got 3.1 kilometer squared. Don't forget the square. Because it's kilometer times a kilometer gives a kilometer square. If we're not putting this down here, then it will be marked as incorrect. So please note that. And that's how you work out your area. Generally, uh, I've given a smaller block, but generally in your exams, we ask you for the highlighted area on the map. This is the one that you uh, generally uh, check and measure for area, because we're basically looking at the area of the autophoto. But once again, please note the scale that you are using. OK, another calculation, bearing. Uh, that's another one that uh, involves three steps. Of course, most occasions, we could ask you to calculate the magnetic bearing. All right? And we must remember. The formula for magnetic bearing is true bearing plus magnetic declination. So actually, it involves three steps. The first step, I'll have to work out my true bearing, then my magnetic declination, and then I have to add the two up to give me my magnetic bearing. So. The answer says, calculate the magnetic bearing, OK? Now, I'm going to look at a point. It says, determine the magnetic bearing of spot height 156D2 from spot height 
one, three, two, two, C, three. Obviously, the blocks are in your uh, map there, okay? For the current year, which is 2011. So, I must remember that wherever the from point is, I am looking at, I'm standing on the from point and I'm looking towards the other point. Okay? So, in my question again, it says calculate the two bearing of spot height 1561 one, one, from uh, spot height 1322. Two. So, I am standing at 1322 two, and I'm looking at spot height 1561. So I need then to look at my map, okay? And there's 1322 two down there and 1561 at the bottom. So the first thing is I have to calculate my true bearing, okay? I look very quickly and I draw my cross on the from point, which is 1322. Two. As I always said, I like to use a set square. So I can put it on my line of latitude and I draw a straight line across. My show it goes through the spot height or through the trig beacon or whatever they give you to draw through. And of course, I can put it on my line of latitude and I can draw a nice straight line. This must be perpendicular. Okay? Once I've drawn my lines, I then measure with my protractor. Now remember, I measure from the true north line. Okay? And I have the center of my protractor right on where the lines cross. And I measure in a clockwise direction. Okay? Remember that. Obviously, before I draw the cross, I must then join the two points. Okay? So now I'm set. So I'm putting my protractor there, and I'm measuring between the two points. Right through, right across. And when I measured between from the true north line going towards that line there, this line actually is joining uh, the two spot heights, I measured my answer as 213 degrees approximately. We give you about one off. That's about it uh, in terms of measuring true bearing. Okay? That's the first step. The next step is to measure the magnetic declination. Remember, we're measuring for the current year. So, I've worked out already my true bearing, which is 213 degrees, and then I need to work out my magnetic declination. A first step, I need to look at what is the magnetic declination on the map. And obviously, you're going to use the information found next to the arrows. And the information there states that the magnetic declination is 15 degrees, 57 minutes west of true north. And also it gives you a year. Don't worry so much about the month, etc., the year. It states 1997. So I record that down. When I'm answering the question, the magnetic declination for 1997 was 15 degrees, 57 minutes west of true north. Now I need to find out for 2011. The first step I need to look at is the difference in years. Remember that magnetic declination was taken for 1997. It's now 2011. So my difference in years would be 2011 minus 1997 which gives me a total of uh, 14 years, all right? Now I need to look back at my map, and my map states something else down here. 
it says the mean annual change is two minutes westwards. All right? I've written it down here. Mean annual change is two minutes westwards, meaning that for every year, it changes by two minutes. Now I want to find out the total change. Okay? Obviously, 14 years have passed, and each year changes by two minutes. So, I find out my mean annual change, or total change. Some people put it in difference in minutes, which is 14 times two minutes, which gives me 28 minutes, and the change is west. I keep remembering that. Now I've got all my information. It's one more step I need to do. I need to find out now the magnetic declination for 2011. Okay? So the change was there. Now remember, if the change is west, we add because the magnetic declination gets bigger. So it's west, obviously we have to add. We show the step down here that we're adding. And when we add it, we can do it this way. And if some of you have a problem in adding, you could do it this way. All right? 15 degrees, 57 minutes, plus uh, 28 minutes. So it makes it easier for you. And obviously, you got 15 degrees, uh, you got 85 minutes. Okay? Now, this 85 we need to change also. Remember, there's 60 minutes in one degree. So, we say, how many times does 60 go into 85? Please, guys, don't use a calculator for this, because it's going to give you a decimal. You work it out manually. 85, 60 goes into 85 once. Okay? So, it goes in once. What's the remainder? The remainder is 25, uh, 25 minutes and one degree. So then I add this. Of course, this degree would go towards the degree section, which makes it 16, and the 25 remains there. So your answer then is 16 degrees, 25 minutes west of true north. Or we could write it W of Tn. Please note. I know I'm very fussy about that. Your answer must reflect that. Okay? And each step of the uh, each step you will get marks for. As you're going through, you're reflecting that. You're showing this. You understand? And in some cases, when you show plus here and the answer. So this could come off for of four or five marks. Don't just show the answer. You may not get full marks for that, even if the answer is correct. Okay, and as you can see, now we worked out the uh, magnetic declination, which is 16 degrees, 25 minutes, west of true north, and we also worked out the true bearing. Now we're ready to calculate the magnetic bearing. Remember, the magnetic bearing is a magnetic declination plus the true bearing. So it's 16 degrees, 25 minutes, plus 213 degrees. Of course, you don't have to put the west of true north. Add those two together, and you got an answer of 22, 229 degrees and 25 uh, minutes. And that is your magnetic bearing. All right. The next one, uh, your favorite section, cross sections. Uh, I will do my best here. Uh, the best method is to sit down person to person and practically do it there. All right. It may not come out so clear down here, but I'll do the best that I can. Okay. Uh, obviously, with cross-section, they could ask you to, to find the cross-section between two points. They, let's say they say from this trig beacon to that spot height. So your cross-section actually starts from the trig beacon, and it goes forward. Just remember that thing there. Uh, just cross-sections, I do believe that you need to visualize your stuff before you actually draw the cross-section, so it gives you an idea. Also, if this section is a problem, I know many students have a problem with it. Leave it for the end. Remember you're answering on the question paper. There's sections or areas where you answer on. So it's not going to mess up with the format. So if it's a problem, leave it for the end. Do your other sections first and then come back to that. 
Otherwise, it's going to frustrate your whole paper. So what do I mean by visualize? Uh, let's take this one here. It speaks about the cross-section. And it says, calculate the cross-section from uh, spot height 1, 3, 2, 8 to tick beacon 2, 5, 2. Now, before I even start over the cross-section, I need to look at the landscape. So, if I'm looking at this landscape down here, I see it's a high point here, and I can make out that it's decreasing as we move through here, and then it's increasing as we come towards the trig beacon, because the trig beacon is a high point. All right? So, if I had to visualize this cross-section, okay, I would say this cross-section would look something like that. So, I've got it in my mind. Okay? If there was a river down here, I'm just giving you an example, then I know also if the river is here, it goes, and I want a cross-section from there to there, I know it'll go in like that. If there was a, uh, a copy or a big beacon and I asked you from that point to that point, I know that the height would increase as going up, so it looks something like that, when it's going up towards a copy and then coming down. So I visualized, I know. So when I'm starting to, to draw my stuff down, I know whether I'm on the wrong line or on the right lines, looking at that. So remember the next step then is, I need to then take my measurements. Remember this is the horizontal axis. I need to find that out. So I then take my piece of paper and I put it against the point. I can even draw a line joining the two, and I put it. Now, one more thing I need you to, to, for you to note. They may say, put down a road, or show a road, or a river, uh, or a footpath, or whatever. As I'm marking my points, I do that. So I start marking my points on my piece of paper. I'm sorry that I'm not doing it fully, but it's, it's very difficult to do it down here. All right, but I'm giving you a general idea that with which you can do it. So I mark my points across. And I've got all my points. I put my readings on each line. What is the measurements? I must also note that sometimes the contour line bends and comes back. I must just double check that so that I know that, hey, that's the same reading. So I mark my points. I've got my points. Now, let's look at the question itself. It says, draw a cross-section from spot height 1328 to tick beacon 252. On your cross-section, show the other road. So remember, I would have marked my road on that. I also got that the vertical scale is 1 centimeter is to 20 meters. Uh, It'll, it won't be viable for me to draw a cross-section here. Yeah? So what I've done is I've drawn one myself. Uh, generally, in your exam, they draw the axis for you. But I've taken one and I drew it the way you would have drawn one without any axis itself. Okay? Remember, my piece of paper again, I marked the points. This is not the same one that we did, but just an example. I marked all my points on this piece of paper. Then, I then took it. Remember, when I looked at my paper for this cross-section, and when you're practicing it at home, you look at what was the lowest point. And in my case, the lowest point was 1,240 meters. I don't need to start from zero, because then I'm going to have a very long page. And I may end off with my page in my neighbor's yard. And I'm sure they won't be thrilled by that. So start off from the lowest point. I left a little gap here. All right? Now, remember the scale was 1 centimeter is to 20 meters. That's your vertical scale. So very quickly, I measure 1 centimeter. As I say, in most cases, this is given to you. So you just need to know where's your starting point. So each centimeter will represent 20. I started from 1,220. I left a little gap so that I can draw my cross-section nice. 1,240, 1,260, 1,280. And my ending point, I don't need to carry on. My highest point was the trig beacon itself, which was below 1,400. So my last point will just be slightly above my highest point. I've got that. <clears throat> now, the next thing I do is I take my points and I 
place my little thing with all my little uh, readings down here that I would have had some points marked off down here. And I then mark them off here and also indicate what it means. I've also indicated my other road, my point for my other road down there. So I've got all my points. Uh, sometimes it confuses you don't know about the accuracy. So what I do, I quickly take my ruler and I draw a little grid across down here. Running across very lightly in pencil. I run it right through with all my lines. And I also run these lines here, going across here. So I've got a little grid, so it makes it easier for me at the end. OK? So now I start plotting my points. Uh, this, for instance, was 1,320. I take it and plot it on 1,320. So I keep plotting my points. OK? And as I plot this, these readings must match that reading. OK? Once I've plotted my points, uh, let me quickly erase this. OK? Once I've plotted my points, I then join the points. You can see the different points there. I join them. I've got my marking of my other road. I can mark it down there. And I can write R, which represents road for me. And of course, I join it right through. OK? It doesn't have to be such a difficult process. I know sometimes you do get confused with the contour lines, etc. But the important thing is that I do it. Remember, in this section, you also get part marks. If your cross section is slightly incorrect, doesn't mean you're going to get a zero. If some points do match, or if your feature, like a road, uh, you put it in the right place, we give you part marks for this. OK? But I know lots of students seem to uh, find this to be a problem. OK? And that's how I mark my points, and my cross-section is complete. Leave it for the end if you have a problem with regards to that. And I do apologize that I couldn't do it in much more detail, but get speak to your teachers and people that know it, and sit and practically do as many cross-sections as you can. The next calculation, uh, gradient. Uh, remember, that's a ratio, but we'll go through it. OK, just to make things easier, I used the same two points that we calculated the cross or worked out the cross section for. Remember, uh, the aim of calculated gradient is to determine the relationship between the vertical height, so-called the vertical interval, and the horizontal distance. Uh, nice to know the meaning of this, eh? It makes sense, like when you're traveling, I don't know if any of you have been towards Durban or coming from Durban or whatever, and you're coming from Gauteng, and you see uh, Van Rienen's Pass, and it shows you a gradient 1 is to 9. Now it will make more sense if you see that. It determines the steepness of an area. It's a relationship between how high you have climbed and how far you have walked, or how far you have driven, uh, etc. OK? And you notice sometimes your dad has to uh, change gear. Well, if you're driving my car, which is a Skoro Skoro, I change right down to number 1 if it's a steep hill. Maybe your dad has got a nice car, and it goes very fast, and he doesn't have to change. But let's look at gradient. Remember, we're calculating the average. I left that out because I want to emphasize that. You'd never get the exact gradient, because no landscape goes like that. It goes, it's undulating. It keeps on. This reminds me of a dance. You understand? But it's undulating. OK? So it's average gradient of an area. Let's look at the formula, guys. Uh, the formula is vertical interval over horizontal equivalent, OK? It could be VI, you don't have to write the full thing, over HE or VD over HD. All right? Now, I know some of you still want VI over HE, et cetera. I'll explain that to you. Now. I'm looking at one here. Calculate the average gradient between the same two points, a spot at 1328 uh, and 252. OK? And of course, I say, explain your answer. So VI is the vertical interval. It's basically the difference in height between the two points. And HE is the 
actual distance between the two points. So you're measuring the map distance and then you're multiplying it by the scale. Again, you must remember which one you're using, the autophoto or the topographic map. In this case, we're using the topographic map. Now, uh, when I go back, uh, when I look at the uh, VI, I already have worked out the heights from my topographic map. It states it. You understand? I could use a, a trig beacon where the number is there and the reading is at the bottom. So when I looked at it down here, I got my two heights. I'm going to refer back to the diagram in case anybody is confused. Uh, this spot height, 1328, is 1328 meters. All right? And this tick beacon, 252, is 1381.2 meters. That's where I get my uh, heights from. Okay? So, for that I can work out. VI, I know now it's, I take the bigger figure, 1381.2 meters minus 1328 meters, which gives me an answer of 53.2. I worked out my VI. Now my HE is measuring the distance between the two. And the same thing I do here. I look at my area, I measure the distance between the two points. Okay, and when I measured that distance, I got 3.2 centimeters. Now, you may notice I'm using meters here. Remember, the top answer already, the VI is in meters. Remember, your scale can be 1 is to 50,000, 1 is to 0 0.5 kilometers, and 1 is to 500 meters. So because the top answer is in meters, I want to have mine in meters at the bottom also, so it's easier to work out. So I said 3.2 centimeters times 500 meters, which gives me an answer of 1,600 meters. I now have worked out VI and I've worked out HE. I'm now ready for working out my gradient. Now, the first thing is that I need then, it says VI divided by HE. I've shortened the formula here, which you can also do in exams. There's my two things. There's my VI, there's my HE. I've got it here. But I want to express it as a ratio. So I need to bring one figure down to one. Obviously, I'll bring my smaller figure down to one, which is 53.2. The only way I can do it is dividing by itself. So I say 53.2 divided by 53.2, which is one. Obviously, what I do to the top, I do to the bottom. You know, we're always dieting also in life. We want all our places to be in proportion. Okay, so. If I divide the top by 53.2, I must divide the bottom by 53.2. So 1,600 divided by 53.2 gives me around 30. I've already worked out my stuff, and now I express it as a ratio. 1 is to 30. What does this mean? Because the second question was saying, explain your answer. What does this mean? It means that for... Remember, it's vertical interval over horizontal equivalent. It means that for every 30 meters you travel horizontally, there will be an elevation of one meter. An elevation of one meter. Sorry, I, we put a meter in a different spelling there. I do apologize for that. But it's an elevation of one meter. Okay, so if I want to draw it like this, I say 30 here, or I don't have to have meters. I could just, because the meters are gone, I could just talk elevation that for every 30 units horizontally, it changes by one unit vertically. That's my explanation for it. Okay? And the bigger the figure here, the more gentle the gradient. The smaller the figure here, the more steeper the gradient. One more calculation, a vertical exaggeration. This is related to your cross-section. Okay, uh, the formula, uh, or let me just look at a little explanation first. Vertical exaggeration is the size by which the vertical scale of a cross section is bigger than the horizontal scale. So remember if we draw a cross section, and if I didn't exaggerate it vertically and I do the exact thing, I could get a cross section something like that. And I may not see exactly 
how the landscape is actually uh, sloping, etc. But if I exaggerate vertically, I could then get a cross section, maybe something like that, and give me an idea, hey, that's a valley. So it's exaggerating it vertically compared to the horizontal. Okay? Let's look at the formula. It's vertical scale divided by the horizontal scale. Vs divided by Hs. Now, I'm not going to go back to the other slide, but remember we stated that the vertical scale was 1 centimeter is to 20 meters. And we know the horizontal scale already is 1 centimeter is to 50,000 centimeters. So we've got the scales, we've got the information. We just need to apply the formula now. OK? So it says calculate the vertical exaggeration of the cross section between uh, 1328 and sp uh, uh, spotted 1328 and Tig Beacon 252 with a vertical scale of 1 centimeters, 20 meters. Let's look at the solution. It's vertical scale over horizontal scale. Just one thing we need to note here, guys. Remember, the vertical scale was 1 centimeter to 20 meters, and the horizontal scale was 1 centimeter to 50,000 centimeters. This unit is different. We have a problem there. We need to convert that because the rest is in centimeters. So if you convert that, remember, there's 100 centimeters in a meter. So if we convert from 20 to centimeters, it becomes 2,000 centimeters. Now we're ready because everything is in order. When we're doing the formula, the vertical scale over the horizontal scale, we can't express it as a ratio scale, because it doesn't make sense. You won't be able to calculate. We express it as a fraction scale. So it's 1 over 2,000 divided by 50,000 over 1. Now, mathematically, you know, in order to make this viable, you then invert and multiply, and you invert the bottom figure. So it becomes 1 over 2,000 times 50,000 over 1. And now we can quickly do it. We say the zeros cancel off. And that 50 times 1 is 50. 2 times 1 is 2. So it's actually uh, 50 over 2. How many times does 2 go into 50? 25 times. And if you're reading this, that shows the vertical scale has been exaggerated 25 times to make the feature clearer for us to interpret. OK, the last piece of uh, work related to cross sections is intervisibility, a very long word. But the answer is much shorter than that. It looks very difficult, but it's very easy. I'm going to go back to uh, the little cross section that we did. OK? Intervisibility is actually the visibility of one point from the other. OK? So if I'm going to look at Trig Beacon 252, which maybe takes a bend like that, OK? And I'm going to look at the other road. And I'm going to ask you, is Trig Beacon 252 visible from R? And all you need to look at down there is, can you see that point from that point? And if you can't, then you say Tig Beacon 252 is not visible from R. If I have something down here and I create D here, and I say, determine the indivisibility of D from R, you can see D from R. So you say D is visible from R. So it's a very simple concept. Sometimes you will get it on a topographic map. And then you must look for any obstructions in between the two points. There could be a copy, you understand, which could obstruct because it's higher than the two points. You understand? All right, so we need to look at those issues there. And it's actually very, very simple to calculate the, uh, the intervisibility between the two points. OK, uh, map interpretation is the next section. Remember, that's 40 marks, so do well. It's in looking at the map itself and th finding things like river direction, etc. One of the things you will be tested is on the cardinal points and looking for direction of one thing from the other. Remember your cardinal points? Okay? 
You have north, south, east, west, then east, northeast, northeast, north, northeast. I am sure that uh, you know most of these cardinal points, and they're found in many books also. Uh, okay, so we spoke about your cardinal points, east, north, south, west. Let's just look at one here. It's very simple. You've already uh, looked at that when, you, when we looked at uh, True Berry. But I want to say, for instance, state the direction of Strig Beacon 252 from spot height 1328. Remember, you are standing at the from point and you're looking at the Trig Beacon 252. So you're standing here. This would be most probably around southeast. Or if I said, find the direction of the dam from spot height 1328, then again, you're standing at 1328, you're looking at the dam, and the dam will be in a westerly direction. Okay, so basically direction, we could ask you that, uh, looking at those features. Uh, so direction, you know. Uh, the next thing we could also get is identifying features on the map and the photograph. It comes out quite often. So let's look a few of these things. It says here, identify feature E marked on the topographic map. Okay, and I played around here because now this we need to check. It's actually also linked to your uh, fluvial processes and landforms. For instance, two questions. Uh, is the feature E associated with incline or horizontal strata? So let's look at this. I look at feature E down here. And I can see in the middle, uh, the, the center uh, contour line is quite broad. So if I'm picturing this, and of course the height decreases going away from the feature, then I'm featuring something like this in my mind. Obviously it can't be a plateau, plateau is too big, but this then becomes a mesa. Because I can see it, it's decreasing in height. Uh, when we look at this feature, we would find that the, air, the center contour line is quite broad. So when I'm visualizing this feature, I can see that the height <coughs> decreases as you move away from the spot height. <coughs> so when I look at it, I can see something like this. The center contour line is broad, and the height decreases as we move away from the feature. So I'm looking at this, and from my fluvial processes, and landforms, I can see that this shape is more a mesa. And again, it says the rock strata associated with this, or the inclination of the rock associated with this. Is it inclined or horizontal sedimentary rock? And that answer will come from my fluvial process and landforms that actually this is horizontal sedimentary rock because we know our mesas. Can you see the significance of these uh, sections interlinked or linked or rather from the paper theory to the map work that we need to focus on both. Uh, with relief also we could look at other uh, questions that can be asked. Uh, for instance, when we look at identifying or describe, uh, I would say more slopes, uh, P and Q. Now remember, identify, you state the type of slope, and describe, you describe it. So here we looked at the contour lines are far apart, and here it's closer together. When it's far apart, it's known as a dip slope, and when it's close together, it's known as a scarp slope. That's identifying, naming them, all right? When you're describing the dip slope where the contour lines are far apart, it's known as a gentle slope. And when the contour lines are closer together, when it's a scarp slope, it's a dip slope. Uh, sorry, when it's a scarp slope, it's a steep slope, all right? Uh, some other ones, look at this one here, I made the one on the cross-section. Draw a rough cross-section from Trig Beacon 46 
to Omdry J4. And this is another one from fluvial processes and landforms. So I'm doing it from this point to that point. Now, you don't have to, if it says rough cross section, please, guys, doesn't mean you must just draw something roughly, or you have to draw a full uh, uh, cross section with all the different points. We just want a rough one, a diagram showing. Now, look at this one. This actually is a four slope elements. If you look at it here, it's gentle, all right? It's coming from the top, from the crest, and then it's moving down, all right, where you can see the convex shape. Then it's getting steep, which is your cliff, and then it's coming uh, gentle, and the lines are equal distance apart, and then it's getting very gentle. So that is our slope elements. And if I had to draw a cross section like this, there it is. Can you see it? There's my two points. And there's my crest, my cliff, my talus, my pediment. OK? Coming from top. And I, can, and I can even ask you to label it. All right? Crest, cliff, talus, pediment. OK, so fluvial processes, landforms involved in our map work. OK, learners, uh, let's look at uh, some questions on uh, drainage itself with regards to the patterns and things like that. OK, if I look at the drainage down here, it says identify the drainage pattern in, bl in block C7 and C8. OK, uh, this is your river. And if you look at it here, you can see it has a branch-like look. OK. And therefore, if you lose your fluvial process and landforms, you would find that this is a dendritic pattern. Another question, let's look at this one, also related to fluvial processes and landforms. The river is rejuvenating itself in block J10. Uh, give one piece of evidence from the topographic map to substantiate this statement. So. I look at J10, and I look at, and again, it's my knowledge of fluvial processes and landforms. What causes rejuvenation? And I know it's a change in gradient, it's a river capture, it's various things. So I look for something that I can find here that will cause a change in gradient. And if I look at this block here, I see clearly there's a waterfall down there. And I know with the waterfall, there's a sharp change in gradient, and obviously rejuvenation has happened. Again, emphasizing the point of knowing uh, the theory and relating it to map work. Guys, practice a lot. Unfortunately, uh, due to time constraints uh, of the program and allocation of time, we cannot cover more. I've, uh, there's so much more in map work, like street patterns, questions related to people and places and people and their needs, and of course the haunting section, GIS, which can be very, very simple. Please remember we don't have uh, computers for every uh, learner writing exams at the end of the year, so it'll be simple stuff like data layers and identifying of concepts. But uh, the booklet that you will be receiving or would have received has got further questions that I've designed for you, covering these sections and go through them, and if there's problems, there is a help desk available. And you can send your problems to those, uh, to the help desk, because we will be having a uh, live show later on, and we will address uh, those issues at the live show. I do apologize, as I say, it was time constraints that limited us in terms of covering this uh, map work program fully. But please do refer to your booklets and bring the questions forward. Uh, guys, I hope what I've done has assisted you. I know I haven't completed everything, but remember, apply, apply, apply. Apply your information. Use the map as much as possible. Use different types of maps. Application for this makes a huge difference. And if you're not clear, make it reality orientated also. Identify it in, in, in the places. You're looking at MISAs and copies. Check for them around you. 
All right? It can be very interesting and very nice. I do wish you all the best in your exams. Study hard. And once again, remember, geography is application. Do as many past papers as possible, whether it's map work or whether it's theory. And it will definitely assist you. All the best.